The medievals are often criticised for their bad child-rearing skills, such as sending their youngsters off to be fostered and trained by other families. Many of the decisions they made as parents are considered bizarre, if not downright cruel today. So just what was needed to survive babyhood in the Middle Ages? Let's travel back in time now to discover how medieval babies were fed and clothed, how precarious their lives were, and how they were lucky to have been conceived at all. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Dirty Little Secret To start with, it's a wonder that we didn't become extinct during the Middle Ages, what with sex being such a taboo subject. No sex on fasting days, no sex while pregnant or breastfeeding, and when it was allowed it could only be done in the missionary position, man on top, and after sunset, with no candlelight. It wouldn't do for a man and wife to see one another naked, as that would be sinful. A baby is cursed with original sin until the baptism, so not dying before that point was always a good idea, or the church would refuse a decent Christian burial. Then the baby would spend all eternity in limbo on the outskirts of hell, with the suicides, heretics, witches, criminals, and beheaded traitors, who could not rise again. Not really the best sounding place for anyone, let alone a tiny baby. If it's looking like the baby is going to die during the birth, the midwife can perform the sacrament in place of a priest. It was the only holy task that a woman could complete. Some midwives would pretend that a baby had taken a breath in some cases of stillbirth, so the child could be given a name and become known to God as only the living can be baptised. It's a wrap. For the medieval, swaddling a baby was quite a creative activity. Young girls were encouraged to practice the art form with their younger brothers and sisters. It was a way to keep the baby warm, comfortable, and safe. Swaddled babies also sleep longer and were thought to have straighter limbs, which is always a bonus. The baby was placed in a simple, open-fronted, T-shaped linen shirt. Then the tail clout was added around the baby's bottom. This was very important and needed to be a double layer. It could be reinforced with a piece of flannel cloth known as a pilch. But leakages could still be a big problem, especially at night and during a punami. Then a wide piece of cloth called a bed was added. It was placed on the baby's chest and then wrapped over the feet and around to the back on the other side. A bib was put under the chin for any dribbling necessary during teething when there is an awful lot of drooling going on. Keeping the baby's head warm is very important. They have a large head compared to their body size and are more susceptible to losing heat from their heads than adults. A cross-cloth linen band was placed across the forehead and then a biggin, which is a close-fitting woolen hat, was placed on the head. Now that the baby's head was set in position, the body could be swaddled with strips of linen about three inches wide wrapped around the baby. In winter, the strips might be made from wool for extra insulation. Wrapping started at the chest and went down to the feet and back up again with no uncomfortable creases. In the end, the child would look like an Egyptian mummy rather than a baby. It was essential to be careful and not stab the baby with one of the pins used to hold everything in place. These were dressmaker's pins, not safety pins. Don't forget how much work was involved in swaddling a baby, and every time the tail clout needed changing, the baby had to be unwrapped and rewrapped again. All in all, swaddling was a complicated and time-consuming activity. How convenient does a baby grow in a packet of pampers sound now? All babies need to crawl about as they get older, so the swaddling came off when they were able to sit up unaided. Some mothers would leave the baby unswaddled and instead lace strips of cloth across their cradle to stop them from falling out. Most babies would have been born to working parents, so many were swaddled onto boards that had a rope or loop attached so the baby could be carried around or hung up on a hook, safely out of the way. Field and farm workers might even hang their babies from a tree or post so that they could carry out their tasks, sort of like a primitive baby harness. Breast is best. Breastfeeding was often discussed during the Middle Ages, and the image of the Virgin Mary suckling the baby Jesus was ever-present throughout medieval Europe. This perfect expression of maternity was something that real women had to live up to, and social pressure to breastfeed was just as intense as it is today. Most women from peasant families, which made up the majority of the European population, suckled their babies. Hey, breast milk was free, and helped to immunise the baby against several diseases. 
Chances were that a baby brought up on cow, sheep, or goat's milk had little chance of surviving before the invention of pasteurization due to the unsanitary methods of feeding. Only the wealthy could afford to employ a wet nurse, the nobility, and later those from the middle classes. Some babies were sent to be nursed immediately after birth. Some parents visited regularly to check on the health of both baby and wet nurse, others didn't even show up once during the period of nursing. The 12th century Trotula, a group of three texts on women's medicine, discusses the best cure for a baby who is unable to sleep. The recipe includes, among other things, cinnamon, ginger, henbane, and the juice of opium poppy. It is recommended that the potion is used, quote, in the nights when children chatter excessively, but only given in the amount of a chestnut. Good job when you consider that henbane is an extremely poisonous plant known in the Middle Ages for its anesthetic properties. The fact that the word bane meant death doesn't fill us with confidence either. The opium poppy, of course, contains morphine, again, not the best drug to be given to a baby. Once weaning began, the trotula recommends that, quote, the meat of the breasts of hens ought to be given because after it begins to take these things well, you will begin to change reliance upon the breast. You should not allow the child to, quote, eat neither sweet nor salty things, so my favorite popcorn is out. It also added that, quote, you should not permit the child to suck at night for obvious reasons. This leads us to our next survival technique, the avoidance of accidental death. Danger, heartbreak dead ahead. Accidents did occur, and in the late 13th century, one toddler crawled out of his crib while his parents were attending a funeral. Two-year-old Roger was the son of one of the cooks at Conway Castle in North Wales. Roger was able to crawl out of his house in the dark and onto the drawbridge. Unfortunately, that is when he fell into the moat. A stranger was passing by and saw poor Roger's body lying there, apparently lifeless. He prayed to Thomas Cantaloupe, the late Bishop of Hereford, for a miracle, and promised a pilgrimage to Cantaloupe's tomb if only the boy could be saved. When the child's mother arrived, she began to wail and beat her breast. It seemed at one point that she may even throw herself into the moat after her son. The little body was retrieved, and Roger was handed to his mother. She ripped open her cloak and warmed the child against her chest. Miraculously, he began to breathe again. Resuscitated, Roger began to gurgle and smile. This story was retold as part of Thomas Cantaloupe's canonization process. Because of this and other tales told of his many miracles, Cantaloupe was made a saint of the Catholic Church in 1320. The story highlights the deep emotion experienced by the loss of a child in the Middle Ages. Medieval children were not disposable or replaceable, they were just as beloved by their parents and cared for by the wider community as they are today. Water was one of the most common dangers for medieval infants. Pools, ditches, ponds, and wells were particularly hazardous for toddlers, as were rain barrels, ale, and wine casks, and bathtubs. Many fell into mill ponds and were swept under the mill wheel where they drowned. Parents were often guilty of leaving their children in the care of someone who was either too young or too incompetent to be given the task. In the 13th century, William, who was two, got away from an 11-year-old servant girl and tried to follow his mother, who had gone to a neighbor's house for dinner. He fell through a hole in the footbridge and into the river. A Flemish sailor took his two-year-old daughter to work, repairing boats on the beach. He realized far too late that he had acted foolishly when he gave her to a girl who was much too young to be a proper guardian. A large wave swept the two girls into the water. The older girl clung onto the pier, but the little one was swept under. Older siblings turned out to be just as unreliable. One six-month-old baby was left in the care of her three-year-old brother while their mother went to thresh barley. The toddler understandably lost interest and ran off to play, and sadly, the baby slips beneath the water. Domestic animals often inflicted injury on medieval babies too. In 1386, a sow was executed in France because it chewed up a three-year-old child who was lying in its cradle at the time. The pig was dressed up as a human for the trial, maimed, and publicly hanged. Sibylla left her four-month-old daughter in the care of another child so she could shear a sheep. The baby was upside down and lifeless, tangled up by the strips of cloth used to tie her in when Sibylla returned. And many others, like six-month-old George, who was not swaddled properly and loosely wrapped in cloth, strangled himself as he tried to get out of his cradle. He had been restrained by only a single band across his chest and a string that held a rattle. High Hopes 
Although not 100% foolproof, cradles did keep most babies out of danger. Once they were mobile, the dangers increased. They fell downstairs, went headfirst into wells, crawled out into the street, and got crushed by passing carts. Babyproofing a medieval house was an impossible task. The parents had a never-ending list of jobs that needed to be done, and even the most diligent mother could be distracted for a few minutes. Figures for the childhood mortality rate during the Middle Ages vary. Some are as high as 50%. So, that's one child dying for every one that survived. And it's been said that the medievals didn't emotionally invest in their children because of this. But there are accounts of mothers going insane with grief after the death of a child and needing counsel from priests over the loss of their faith in God. Most medieval parents were loving, affectionate, hopeful for their baby's survival, and prayed that their child would be one of the 50% that grew up to be a strong and healthy adult. It is true that many medieval babies died in infancy. Fortunately though, if the child could live through until their teens, they had got through the worst of times, and their life expectancy went up dramatically. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe if you're enjoying these videos, and as always, I'll see you next Friday for another one. Until then, hope everyone has an amazing week. Cheers.